الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الصادقين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ما بعد respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته we continue now with tafsir of Surah Al-Kaf Surah 18 of the Quran those of you who have the Quran would you follow it those of you who have learned the Surah then you know what verse I'm reciting Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim ما لهم به من علم ولآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم أي يقولون إلا كذبا. When you examine what we have examined in Surah Al-Kaf, we find that we are just like those people who had given sons to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who had given daughters to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We said there are three groups of people in the Quran. One was the Jews who gave Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala a son called Uzair. The second group of people were the Christians who gave a son to God called Jesus. And the third group of people were the Arabs who said that the angels were the daughters of God. Quran continues to say that they have no knowledge concerning what they're saying. The idea here is, مَا لَهُمْ بِهِمْ مِنْ عِلْمٍ وَلِيَابَاهِمْ Nor do their fathers have any knowledge. Here, this idea of آبَاهِمْ in the Quran is an idea which has been mentioned over 60 times in the Quran. Anyone who goes to examine the word Aba'ihim will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously stresses in the Quran the idea that in some communities people just follow simply what their fathers have followed. Be the community religious, be it cultural, you will find around the world today there are some people who are not allowed to think for themselves. The moment a person is allowed to think for himself, he is called a rebel in the community. All I want to do is just think. All I want to do is just ask. I'm not trying to leave the religion, I just want to know why this happened. I know sometimes there, is a, there isn't a why for everything, but at least let me ask the question. Some people have in some cases spoken out against the religion of Islam, because they say that most people within the religion of Islam are simply following what their fathers are following. They don't have freedom of choice. If they do want to speak out, they are then described as being rebellious. And even in our own community, I believe that in the Muslim world today, there are some instances where when we do want to speak out about certain issues, there is a hierarchy which governs what you can speak out against and what you can't. But that's an issue to be discussed on a different place. What you find in the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in numerous occasions how when you continuously just follow what your fathers have done and you yourself do not put any input you will find that the religion doesn't become a guide for you. As an example, let me give you an example in the Shia world. Every Muharram we have lectures for 12 nights. Let's say for 10 nights or 12 nights. And in Ramadan we have lectures for 30 nights, let's say. Why don't we have 10 lectures for Imam al Shahadat? Why don't we have 10 nights for Bibi Fatima? Why don't we have 10 nights for Imam Jawad? Why can't anyone come forward and do it? Why does it have to be the same in every year, every occasion? Why is it that we can't change the, the status quo? Okay, 10 nights remains for Imam al no one's going to change it. And 30 nights of Ramadan remains. But if there is no initiative in a community to change what has come before in a good way, then you will find that it becomes stagnant and becomes a ritual rather than a lesson. Let me give you an, another example. The mimbar of Imam al Hussein, where lecturers come to lecture. has always been a place to sit down and watch the lecturer, listen to him and leave the matches. No one's changed this. It's remained the same. But why is it that the member of Imam al Hussein, which was originally built so that people could sit down, when they listen to the lecturer, they take notes as the lecturer is speaking. Why is it that this isn't introduced into communities? Why is it that it's still the same? Every speaker who comes, every Muharram, every Ramadan, Everyone listens to him and then moves away. No one's taken any notes, no one's taken any references, no one's taken any verses, and we just move on like we do every year. The idea is that once in a while a person has to speak out. 
and he has to speak out against how a community is running in order that people see initiative being produced. And this is exactly what Nabi Ibrahim did with his community. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wants us to see how a community if it just simply follows its forefathers without putting any initiative, how it will never change, Allah always shows us Nabi Ibrahim. And he always uses the word Aba'ihim, 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 their fathers, their fathers, their fathers. So if you look in the Quran in Surah 21, verse number 53 in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes for us the story of Nabi Ibrahim. And it's really interesting when you hear the words of the opposition when they're discussing with Nabi Ibrahim. Look at what happens here. Surah 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Is qala li abihi. Prophet Ibrahim speaks to his father or his uncle. Ab means what in Arabic? Ab means father. But if my father passes away when I'm young and I'm looked after my, by my uncle, I would call my uncle my father. The reason we believe it's no way can be his father is because we state every prophet of God comes from a line of pure believers in God. Ibrahim's uncle, as I mentioned in my lecture, was an idol worshipper. Therefore, there is no way that could be his father. The Quran says, if qala li abihi, our brothers in other schools in Islam say, yes, that's his father. We in the school of Ahlul Bayt say that a prophet or an imam cannot come from a father who is an idol worshipper. As we state with Abba Abdullah, we say, "Ashhadu annaka kunta nuran fil aswab al-shamah, wal arham al-mutahhara, lam tunajjik al-jahiliya bi-anjat." But Abba Abdullah came from a line of pure wounds, and each of these wounds never once was there an idol worshipper. There may have been on the branches idol worshippers. There may have been uncles who may have been, but in terms of father. Father, father, going back to Ibrahim, there was never an idol worshipper in their line. إِذْ قَالَ لِأَبِيهِ وَقَوْمِهِ مَا هَذِهِ التَّمَاثِيلُ الَّتِي أَنْتُمْ لَهَا عَاكِفُونَ He says to his people, what are these idols that you are worshipping? Continues to say, قَالُ وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا We found our fathers لَهَا عَابِدِينَ We found our fathers worshipping them. Do you notice here, the religion of Islam isn't so much concerned with what religion you're in. It's more concerned with freedom of thought, not freedom of belief. There is a difference between freedom of thought and freedom of belief. To have freedom of belief does not necessarily mean you have freedom of thought. I believe in Ahlul Bayt. Does that mean I know how to prove it? Does not mean I know how to prove it? If I, cha- if I am challenged by anyone about Ahlul Bayt's history, do I know how to prove it? Freedom of belief doesn't mean a human being has freedom of thought. But freedom of thought will eventually result in freedom of belief. You see how the difference works? That's why in some religions in the world, especially the polytheists, polytheistic religions are more a case of freedom of belief than freedom of thought. Islam, when it came to Arabia, wasn't concerned that I'm making people Muslims. No. I'm more concerned in opening the thought processes within the Arabian people. Look at this baby female. Why are you killing her alive? Don't come to Islam. No, don't worry about Islam. I just want to free up your thought cells. Because sometimes if our thought cells get too congested, we cannot become free. Here these people, the problem is, he says, they say, قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا We found our fathers worshipping them. So what did we do? We done the same. We found our fathers doing 10 nights of Muharram. So what did we do? We done the same. None of our fathers done 10 nights for Imam al-Baqir, so I'm not going to do 10 nights for Imam al-Baqir. Do you notice the human being, one of the attributes within the human being is conformity. In the UK, we have a nice example of conformity, how the human being just conforms to what is in front of him without ever changing it. You've seen in the UK, there's a, um, a bus, uh, bus timing uh, board, which says you can't go in this area between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. When it's 8 p.m., the area is free for you to go through, because that one is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. 
Yet people are so in tune in the idea that they've never gone in that bus stop, that they never ever check what's going on. Until one human being goes in that area, everyone starts following him. But unless one went in the bus area, no one will follow him. The bus lane, no one will follow him. Here the idea is that the human being simply conforms to that which is in front of him without ever asking for details. And so he continues, listen to what he says. Well, if you're just following this, these idols because your fathers worship them, then you and your fathers are all astray. You and your fathers are all astray. Because the religion of Islam opens freedom of thought. Remember yesterday I said, Usul al-Din is where Islam opened the freedom of thought. It said that you must be able to prove it. You don't follow Amarja. Amarja you follow for Ru'ad Din. But in Usul you are free to go and do your research. They say to Nabi Ibrahim, have you come with the truth or are you one of those who is just playing about with the words? Look what Nabi Ibrahim tells us. That the sunnah of any prophet of God is that first he tries to open the freedom of thought. Then he tells them about God. Don't jump in in da'wah straight away. Believe in God, Muhammad, Imam, come from Muharram. Slowly. First, let me open your thoughts. Let me make you understand what type of different philosophies there are. And then I'll introduce you to God. Your Lord is the one who created the heavens and the earth. He then tells them, I will make sure that I plot against these idols that you worship. Because idol worshipping, according to Islam, brings about the most decayed soul in the human being. Do you know why? The idol worshipper, however much he in front of you sounds like a nice person, his soul is actually a soul which is never ever considered that that statue which it worships cannot benefit itself and cannot benefit him. Therefore, he is not only believing in ignorance, he is plagued by ignorance. It only takes a few seconds for me to look at the statue and say, there's no way this can be worshipped. But when I as an idol worshipper insist that this statue is greater than anything around me, that's when you know I have an energy around me which can harm others. Because all I am building is ignorance, not thought. Ignorance. So it continues to say, فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ Nabi Ibrahim broke all the idols except which one? In, except the biggest one. إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ So that when they come back, because as you know, the people of Nabi Ibrahim, they went out of town. They used to have a festival. And they used to have a temple where all the idols were placed. Nabi Ibrahim comes, he breaks all the idols except which one? biggest one. Why? Look at how a prophet of God works here. He simply wants to open the thought patterns. I'm not making you Muslims. I want to do something which will make you think for the first time in years about the way you've simply followed your fathers. When they return, what do they say? قَالُوا مَنْ فَعَلَ هَذَا بِآلِهَتِنَا إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Who has done this to our idols? He is one of the what? One of the oppressed, the unjust ones. This is what they reply. We heard of a youth who was insisting on this way. His name was Ibrahim. Notice how they don't say, we heard of Ibrahim. No, we heard of a youth. In any community, when a youth strikes a difference, everyone notices. Be they at the age of 10, 15, 20, 25, everyone will notice a difference. And they didn't just say, Ibrahim, he broke our idols. No, there is a use. The idea of our prophet, he always says, make sure you make use of your youth before old age. Don't let those years waste. Ask yourself in your youth, especially the youth who are sitting today. Ask yourself, how many people have I brought towards Ahl al-Bayt? How many people have I made understand the religion of Islam? And this should transfer to the elders who should ask themselves in all my life, have I been able to defend Ahl al-Bayt in every debate? Or am I scared to enter debates because I may not have the knowledge to defend al Muhammad? Anyone who is a follower of Ahl al-Bayt should be ready to enter into dialogue with those opposing Ahl al-Bayt. 
قالوا سمعنا فتى يذكرهم يقال له ابراهيم قالوا فاتوا به على اعين الناس لعلهم يشهدون you know what they say they say go and bring that ibrahim all of you catch him everyone bring him now let's burn him the moment of truth is coming up now about what ibrahim aims with all these people who followed their fathers قالوا انت فعلت هذا بالهتنا يا ابراهيم ابراهيم did you do this to our idols you, what does he reply قال بل فعل no the big one but what does he say to him كبيرهم the big one هذا فاسألوهم إن كانوا ينطقون ask him if he can speak that's the point I've been waiting to reach with all of you Ibrahim is telling me you told me who done it I'm pointing at the big one now let me open your thought processes ask him if he can speak surely a God who is meant to protect the human being is a God who can defend himself and so he says let him speak no reply the Quran describes what happens to them beautifully absolutely beautifully look what the Quran says فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ the first thing they did was that they returned back to their souls what does it mean? it means for the first time they actually asked themselves inquisitively what have we been doing all our life? what have we been worshipping and why? The Quran doesn't just say فَرَجَعُوا No, it says فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ They return back to their soul For the reason being what? That the soul is the center of seeking truth in the human being Our soul, when you look at the nafs The nafs can be in three stages The nafs can be ammara, The nafs can be lawama, Or the nafs can be mutma'inna Nafs al ammara. what does it mean? It means when I commit haram and I don't care anymore who are you going to stop me from going to that place? I want to go, my friends are all there, we all hang out there who are you to tell me it's haram? who are you to tell me smoking this substance is haram? who are you to tell me engaging in this piece of business is haram? I'll engage and I'll meet whoever told you it's haram on the day when it counts Nafs al-Ammara is the lowest self that human being can reach because it's when he commits haram and has no more guilt in himself. Inshallah, none of us reach this. But it's a level many have reached somewhere in their life where they are committing and committing and committing and no one can stop them. Nafs al-Lawama is when you commit a sin but after committing it you think to yourself, why did I just do that? You feel guilty when you go home that night. You feel guilty after the transaction. You feel guilty after what you've just said. It's called the self of consciousness, which means guilt is still within you. You still feel sad about why you acted the particular act. Nafs al mutma'inna is when you are certain about every action you are doing in your life. It is a level which is described that, as Ali ibn Talib used to say, before I commit any act, I see Allah before it and I see Allah after it. Which means what? Which means before I do anything or say anything or meet anyone, I think, does Allah accept? And then I think, will Allah be happy? Nafs al mutmainna is a stage of certainty where every movement you made in your life is purely for the religion of Islam and no one else. Here, therefore, these people, the Quran says, فَرَجَعُوا إِلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ for the first time they actually reflected on their souls and they thought to themselves why have we been indulging in haram without ever feeling guilty about it they said surely all of us have been oppressors towards ourselves the Quran gives the description that these people are all scratching their heads you know when you're confused about the way you've been living your life you go home, get the cigarette out and look out from the window and think, what have I been doing all this time? And you look one way and look the other, these people are in the same situation. They are confounded. They looked at each other, do you know what they say? They say, we know that none of these idols can speak. How are we then worshipping them? Why are we worshipping objects that can't even speak? قَالَ أَفَتَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَنْفَعَكُمْ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَضُرُّكُمْ You are worshipping besides Allah that thing which doesn't harm you but that thing which doesn't benefit you as well. 
it is just a piece of wood. It's not going to harm, but it's not going to benefit you in any way. Uffilakum walima ta'budun. Uff has been where in, uh, used where in the Quran? With our parents. Wala taqullahuma uffin. Wala tanharuhuma. Do not even say uffin to the parents, but you say uffin to the idol worshippers. Two completely different situations. Some people came forward and said, here is a test of obedience. Why? With our parents, we don't say offering because obedience is wajib. Whereas with the idol worshipper in an Islamic state, there is no place for obedience for an idol worshipper in the Islamic state. It's not a matter of, look at the religion of Islam, it doesn't allow other religions. No. Religion of Islam says Christians and Jews can live in the Islamic state. True. The only people who cannot live in the Islamic state simply because their religion is one that spreads simple ignorance is the polytheist. Because the polytheist, as I said, doesn't spread freedom of thinking. The polytheist simply spreads the idea of ignorance and complacency around the community. And then it continues to say, instead of them coming towards Nabi Ibrahim, do you know what they do? Sometimes a person, when you give him da'wah, when you do Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahi al Munkar, Imams of Ahlul Bayt, what do they say? They say there are three conditions for Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi al Munkar. Number one, that you know what you're talking about. Don't go and tell them to do halal when you don't do it. Go, don't go and tell them something haram when you do it. Don't go and tell him about Imamat if you don't know how to explain it. Don't go and tell him about Nubuat if you've never read a book on it. Number one, Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahi al Munkar, you must know what you're talking about. Number two, you must act it. Number three, don't speak to the fool. If the guy is telling you, when you're talking to him, he's just putting his hands on his eyes or putting his hands on his ears, peace, I'll go to someone else. Don't stick on a person wasting your time with someone who's put his hands on his ears. Let your akhlaq do the talking from now. If you've noticed that your talk isn't doing the talking, let your akhlaq do the talking. That will be enough. And what you find here with these people, instead of them coming and saying, yes, Ibrahim is right, clearly he's just defeated our thinking, they are so much steeped in ignorance that the first thing they say is what? قَالُوا حَرِّقُوهُ Burn him. Burn him. وَانْصُرُوا آلِهَتَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ فَاعِلِينَ This is a great maneuver. All the idol-worshipping kings or idol-worshipping lords in the Qur'an, the moment they are defeated in terms of reason, the first thing they do is appeal to the culture of the people. Sometimes when an alim tries to appeal through reason, the president will appeal to the people through culture. Alim will say this is not acceptable. The president will say no one changes what we've done for 200 years. In the same way here, when Fir'aun was defeated by Musa, the magicians went down in sujood to Musa, true? What was the first thing Pharaoh appealed for to the whole of Egypt? Do not let Musa change years of your culture. We've been following Pharaohs for years. Don't let Musa change it now, you've been doing well. When a Zalim has no answer, the first thing he resorts to is to the emotions of the human being. In the same way here, what do they say? They say, first burn him, then one furrow in kuntum fa'aleen. Help your idols, because this is something you've been doing for years. Then what happens is they went and gathered so much wood. The hadith narrates for us the amount of wood they gathered. The bird, when it flies over, the bird melts. You've all seen a barbecue at home. Each one of us thinks he's good at doing a barbecue. And we act brave in front of our young ones. Even though we're burning, but we act brave. No, no, this is fine. I'm ready. My hand's burning. That is something a little bit hot. Imagine a fire which the whole community has got wood for. And they put Nabi Ibrahim. Nabi Ibrahim, the angel of wind, comes and asks him, O Prophet of God, do you want me to remove the fire? No. Angel of water, O Prophet of God, do you want me to extinguish the fire? Jibra'il comes and says, if you want, I'll destroy all these people. Tawakkul at its finest. 
And so what happens is, when he is thrown in, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does he forget a servant of his who has tried to bring people towards Islam? Understand this one point, that when you go out in the world and try and bring people towards Islam, there is no way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will neglect you in anything in your life. Because straight away, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِ بَرْدًا وَسَلَامًا O oh, fire become a place of coolness and tranquility for Ibrahim. Amir al-Mu'mineen was asked, Why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Fire become a place of coolness. Just coolness. And Amir al-Mu'mineen replied, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made fire just a place of coolness, Ibrahim would have died of freezing. So Allah said, Bardan wa salama. Make it a place cool but tranquil as well for the one in there. If he had just made this cool, Ibrahim would have died freezing, it would have been too cold. But Allah made it cold but peaceful. For his servant to simply be dancing in the middle of the fire while everyone is looking. The beauty in the conclusion of this Ibrahim story is that you know the ruler of the time, Nimrod. Nimrod was the ruler of the time, like Fir'aun, Nimrod. When Nimrod saw Ibrahim burning in the fire, he thought surely he must be dead. But then he saw Ibrahim playing with the fire. He thought, do you know what he replied? He said to Nabi Ibrahim, he said, you know what Ibrahim? Your God seems very strong. Can we meet him? Because Nimrod believed what? Nimrod believed he was one of many gods. And he believed Ibrahim's God was one of those many gods. So he said, I'm devoting a thousand cattle or a thousand sheep towards him. Devoting, subhanAllah, he needs devoting. And then he says, can we meet him? Nabi Ibrahim, you would think he'd get angry when someone speaks like this. Because Nimrud is, is adamant. It's like someone coming and telling me, saying, Ammar, you know God, is there any chance I can meet him in Jannah? Is there like a third floor, me and him need to sit about our accounts? Because I'm not sure about the way he's treated my family. In the same way here, Nimrod comes forward. Nimrod, when he comes forward, he says, can we meet? Nabi Ibrahim, he replies with beauty. Why? Because when people come in ignorance towards you, reply to them with akhlaq, you'll be successful. Without akhlaq, no community will be successful. No community. You could tell me you've learned the Quran, you've learned Nahj al you've learned every hadith in the world. I don't care. Because if the akhlaq isn't there, they mean nothing to me. In the same way, Nabi Ibrahim, to show his prophethood, when this person came with such a statement, you would think he'd say, how dare you talk about my God like that? You think my God is something simple, you can just go and meet him? Nabi Ibrahim replies, no. In Surah 2, verse 258, what does he say? Quran says, أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَ إِبْرَاهِمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَاهُ اللَّهَ الْمُلْكِ have you seen the one who disputed with Ibrahim? If قَالَ Ibrahim, رَبِّ الَّذِي يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ Nabi Ibrahim said to him, My Lord is not the same as you. He said to him, what do you mean? He said, My Lord is the one who gives life and he causes death. Nimrod replied, قَالَ أَنَا أُحْيِي وَأُمِيتِ I give life and I cause death. Nabi Ibrahim said, how? He said, I've got two prisoners in my prison. Two prisoners. Both are sentenced to death. I let one of them out and I kill the other. So I've given one of them life and I cause death. You would think with another argument like this, Nabi Ibrahim would now say, forget it, I don't want to talk with this person. What do you mean? I've got two prisoners, one of them I let go, therefore I've given him life, and the other one I kill, therefore I cause death. This Nimrud is in his own planet. So then Nabi Ibrahim comes back with an argument where he says, this is my decisive argument. He says, قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهِ يَأْتِي بِالشَّمْسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرَقِ Allah brings the sun from the east, you make the sun rise from the west. My Lord makes it come from the east. You make it rise from the west. At this moment, new Nimrod knew, I think me and Ibrahim's God are a bit different. Because the one about the death I could get away with. But as for making that sun come out from the west, that's impossible. He said to Ibrahim, get out of town and never come back again. The idea Nabi Ibrahim simply wanted to put was what? I'll never get angry with those who I dialogue. All I want to do is what? Give them freedom to think. 
the religion of Islam didn't come to spread itself by saying become a Muslim, no. First it wanted Arabians to come and be free to think. The moment the Arabians were free to think, then they came towards the religion of Islam. Inshallah we will continue tomorrow. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.